Hello and welcome everybody to the next in our occasional series of BTRM video interviews. It's our pleasure today to welcome Mr. Colin Johnson, who is Chief Product Officer at Almis International, but also the former chairman of UK Alma, that was the UK ALM Association. Now, Colin and I go back many years. In fact, we first got together as uh, Alma trainers, where we were on the Alma committee and we used to teach a course uh, for, uh, for the Alma Association to practitioners. That was some years ago now. Now, Colin uh, has a long track record in banking and in asset liability management. He was with uh, Birmingham Midchars Building Society, West Brom. He was with Lloyds Bank, uh, or sorry, was it Lloyds Bank? Colin, say hello, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> Lloyds, then, then Santander. Then Santander. Righto. So thank you very much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you. And uh, we're going to have a 10 minute conversation about uh, the horizon for ALM practitioners uh, currently, what things are looking like for bank practitioners. Now, Colin, first of all, right now here, we're just emerging from lockdown. Uh, we've had last year's stress event in the current environment for banks. Uh, there are many challenges facing us. There is, the, there is the, the flat yield curve, very low, practically zero base interest rate. There's competition from a, a whole host of, of new entrants, uh, fintech, digital banks. Uh, there are ongoing recessionary worries. And there are signs that uh, uh, banks are re-emerging or re-engaging with customers and uh, considering possibly uh, greater risk in terms of credit uh, for the for the loans they're offering to the products they're offering to customers in this environment as an ALM practitioner or, or former ALM practitioner with a keen interest in the market still what are your views on uh, what uh, we as uh, as risk managers should be looking out for over the next two three years uh, thanks Morad uh, welcome everyone I think the one of the main things for me is actually looking at and thinking about what, what people are doing on behavioral transformation um, you know there are huge impacts that you can have on your your balance sheet typically through what you apply as your behavioral assumptions, whether that is on the asset side to you know the duration or prepayment rates or on the liability side on the, the stickiness of deposits, say. Um, both of those tend to be built off historical models, historical analysis, and you know, even kind of before the, the most recent crisis, pe people were sort of saying, oh, well, the, the past isn't necessarily an indication of the future, but certainly. I think everyone will agree the last two years have not been normal in any way. <laughs> now, we don't know exactly what coming out of this will mean, um, you know, when, when you overlay the complexity of, you know, government's intervention in the UK furlough schemes, yeah. QE, everything else that, that is sort of there. But certainly, I don't think it will be exactly the same as the last 12, 18 months. So simply go in, you know, my, my average prepayment rate has been 5%, I'll assume it is, um, it isn't probably the best way. Uh, and also, you know, to be a little bit brighter and think, what impacts do these have on my risk? And, you know, if I'm very sensitive to my prepayment rate, I need to pay a lot of attention to this. Whereas if actually I'm not that sensitive to it, because I don't care whether it's zero or 10, you know, I will still be okay and solvent and make money, then actually you don't need to worry as much. The one thing that I, I think is perhaps different this time, and it's a consequence of previously, particularly in the UK, has been the, the regulatory overlay. So the regulator gets a lot more information uh, because of previous crises, and they have been focused much more. And as a consequence of that, particularly in the UK, they've made banks have in senior roles and particularly in non-exec roles people who actually understand some of these ALM risks so previously banks might have had that done in a tre treasury department and it was kind of technical whereas now on your board and in your your non-exec you've got people that understand these and I think the main thing for that is what it means you're going to get questions from the regulator that will come directly into the board and questions from your ALM team feeding up through MI making sure that you're joined up in what you're doing in ALM with what you're actually sending the regulator as well when you talk about you know, your LCR, your assumptions, your stresses, what people are thinking about, because you don't want to, to be having differences there. So having that, and I mean, we've probably talked about it hundreds of times at previous <laughs> things, the kind of the holistic view of the balance sheet, but actually making sure that encompasses um, that regulatory um, 
lens as well in, in terms of what you're portraying into the regulator. That That's a very good point you made at the end. I mean, they were all good points, but absolutely right. The, the regulatory focus um, has resulted in a greater level of expertise in addressing these sorts of risks. So in that respect, we've learned a lesson from the previous crash. I suppose your first point was we've got to take lessons away from this most recent stress event by being uh, being more adaptable, by not just carrying on with the same assumptions as before, but p possibly re-engineering uh, what our views were or, or reassessing behaviours and assumptions to take lessons learned away from the last, uh, from this most recent uh, stress event. Yes? Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, and I think it's that like being flexible in terms of, do you know what, you're not always going to get it right. It's not about getting it right yeah. but it's actually if you've got it wrong being able to go that's wrong the world's a bit different let's change what does that mean and you know doing it both after the event but also preemptively knowing you know of your let's say 100 assumptions that go into your model if there's two of them that break the bank you, you probably want to be much more strict on those than the three that actually are rounded errors you know it's understanding Absolutely, your vulnerability yes. you know no, no, that's a very good point as well at the end of the day there's we shouldn't think that this is an exact science. There's a lot of assumptions and estimations built in. We should just uh, be, adapt be adaptable and respond to that. Excellent. Thanks very much, Colin. Now, at the moment, I mentioned the, the, the flat yield curve, very low interest rates. The spread between the, the cost of funding and the, the, the lending rate uh, is, 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 is narrowing always. And we've got a lot of competition out there. Uh, banks in the, uh, every bank can count. Uh, anything from five to 20 other banks in its immediate peer group. Uh, if you're an ALM manager uh, struggling, well, well, addressing the, the challenge of increasing net interest margin or preserving it, what are the sorts of things that we should look out for given we've got such a flat yield curve and such a low base rate and probably staying there for some for some time? Yeah, the, 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 the yield curves, I, I always think is an interesting one in that I, I don't know how many alcos over how many years I've heard people say, well, but rates can't go any lower, can they? <laughs> and, you know, we kind of heard that probably first, you know, a decade ago. Um, and we've systematically gone from, you know, 0% rates. Well, I suppose in the UK, let's say 5% flat it was. Then we got zero at the short end, but it was still three at the long end. And then slowly that long end has come down to, to it is, you know, albeit zero, negative. And people go, oh, but rates can't go any lower, can they? It's like, well, Personally, I don't think they're going to go massively negative in the UK, but I don't think I would want to say they can't. <laughs> um, so, you know, understanding what that might mean, absolutely. Um, from the bank's point of view, you know, the, the reality with a lot of this is it's kind of risk reward. Um, you know, I think there's a danger that people see a free ride on something. Oh, you know, I'll do this and oh, I'll, I'll diversify my liquidity into HQLI and I'll pick up 10 basis points. And, you know, if you are a, you know, a UK sterling denominated bank and you're going and buying, you know, European bonds just because they count as there and you're picking up 10 basis points. Well, understanding what risk that actually brings and whether it's adding to your overall you know, whether it's pro-cyclical, counter-cyclical, whether you're already o overweighting that, you know, and this kind of goes back, one of the lessons from the you know, the crisis with HBOS in terms of, you know, the after the event questions, which is someone who's fully invested in taking money out of the mortgage market, investing all of their liquidity in mortgage-backed securities, didn't turn out to be the brightest thing in the end. Um, you, you know, and just understanding that. Um, yeah, quite right. I, I don't think... Uh... I mean, that sort of mistake is, un well, I would have hoped, we would have hoped unlikely to be repeated. But there is, nevertheless, we we should be addressing, I think, uh, and I'd be interested in your view on some sort of optimization of the HQLA, because of course, gilts play next to nothing. Um, and if, if we can remain, I suppose that's the sweet spot, isn't it? If we can remain within level one, we can remain uh, within an asset class that we understand, the risks, the movements we understand, but try and pick up some extra yield that's still something that you'd want to discuss in an alco, right? Oh, ab absolutely, yes. And I, I, t to me, I think a simple way is think of it as, you know, it's liquid. You're buying liquidity insurance. Yeah. You know, how much liquidity insurance do you want? You know, and it's like, well, actually, yes, you can stick your entire liquid asset buffer into the Bank of England so that it is all there the first day you need it. The reality is, there is no way that you will ever need it all. 
on that first day because you're out of business anyway. And probably, you know, the stress, you know, you can sit in your ALM world, and this comes back to being holistic, you know, sit in your ALM world and do a stress test that says, you know, 30% of the balance sheet leaves. Well, you'll probably find that operationally, your mortgage team can't do that or your savings team <laughs> can't do that. So, you know, there are there are constraints. And if you have got them, you know, if your maximum outflow is, you know, 100 million in a week and you've got a billion, well, there is no point in paying yes. for that extra insurance by holding it short. You should yeah. be thinking of duration. And yeah. then there is, the you know, the combination. And, you know, the markets are massive. You know, the UK guilt market is massive um, for doing repos. Uh, but maybe not if you're a big player for outright sales. Yeah. You know, you don't want to have to do that. So you may be better off if you've got to raise physical cash, having other assets, yeah. you know, that, that are slightly less notionally liquid because of the repo side. But actually, you know, you can, to raise funds, you can do little bits in different markets more so than you can if you've just got, you know, if I, I'm just going, I'm selling all my gilts, you know, that's a, a, a red sign to people potentially. <laughs> Uh, so it is just thinking and having that, you know, like you say, diversified view and, you know, yield matters. You know, you can't afford to be giving money away. Banks, you need to make money. You need to have a viable business model. And if the rest of the bank's business model isn't viable, propping it up by whatever you want to call trading in your treasury or, you know, taking on, you know, structural interest rate, whatever, is not a good long-term solution. You know, you need to have yes. that that viable business model and focusing on, you know, good old-fashioned stable net interest income. You know, what are my what are my funding costs? What are my lending costs? And I I understand those and I'm pricing them in. Plus, I'm pricing in the risk so that, you know, I I don't, you know, just undercut somebody for the sake of chasing a volume target. Lots of good points there. And as as so often in our more than 10 years uh, working together, Colin, I, I'm in 100% agreement. <laughs> so we're not going to get a violent debate on we this need, We need an argument. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do, we're will do. we going to reprise this video again. Thank you very much. Before I go, uh, you used the expression holistic view of the balance sheet. Uh, you and I were talking about this concept of strategic ALM, strategic asset liability management, uh, f f for all these years. And I still quote you uh, in, in my slides, in my presentations, I still quote you. Um, so for all the viewers out there, everyone watching, Mr. Johnson's definition of strategic ALM or what he referred to as the holistic view of the balance sheet uh, in managing it was basically to have the head of lending sitting next to the head of deposits in the same building. That would ensure strategic ALM. And I still quote that because if we can do that, we're uh, a long way to getting a less holistic approach. So uh, that's still quoted, Mr. Johnson. Thank you very much Absolutely. For, for, your, for your time. We will reprise this actually. Uh, we'll have another part two, I think. Uh, to discuss these further points that you've raised. Uh, and also we haven't discussed about interpolating the yield curve. I know that's a favorite topic for you, Colin. So thank you again. Thank you everybody for listening. Uh, my thanks to Colin Johnson, Chief Product Officer at Almis and former Chairman of UK Alma Association. Uh, I'm Morad Chowdhury. It's been a BTRM video interview and we will see you again soon. Thanks very much and take care. Bye-bye.